Okay, dear all, welcome to this uh, evening uh, where we shall discuss uh, the state of our democracy with a host of very eminent uh, guests. Does it work? Yes, it does work. Okay, well, uh, the, the program for tonight is as follows. We will have a short introduction uh, by Nick de Boer, um, uh, followed by uh, uh, an exciting lecture by uh, Anneline de Dijn. Uh, then we have two uh, comments uh, by Tamar de Waal and Matthijs uh, Roduin. And then uh, we will give you the floor for a discussion and debate. And of course, if you want to pose your question, perhaps in, in Dutch, that's also uh, possible. Um, but in principle, it is an English uh, uh, evening and where we shall discuss uh, the future and, and, and state of our uh, democracy. Okay, I would like to start with uh, Nick de Boer. I can introduce you. You're an associate professor in constitutional law. You just published a brilliant counterintuitive book on uh, uh, the judges and, uh, and, uh, and, and constitutions. And above all, he's here as the, as the intellectual uh, uh, parent of our uh, brand new uh, um, program in, 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 in uh, a normative foundations of democracy of the Faculty of Law, Social Sciences and Humanities, a very rare experiment where three different faculties uh, collaborate. Okay, Nick, I give you the floor. So thank you very much, Matthijs. Um, thank you all very much um, for being present here today, those in person as well as those uh, online. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you here today because uh, this lecture today also um, marks the launch of our new University of Amsterdam platform for democratic resilience. And the reason, of course, that we are launching this platform is that democracy today is not in very good health. Uh, this year's Varieties of Democracy Project, which is an influential report on the state of democracy in the world, notes that democracy enjoyed by the average person in the world uh, in 2020 23 is now down to 1985 levels uh, and 71 percent of the global population now live in an autocracy that is a non-democracy uh, and we see also that in established democracies democracy is not necessarily taken for cannot necessarily taken for granted to be anymore um, so understanding why uh, democratic decay happens um, and what we can do about it is a is an issue of uh, crucial societal importance democracy is the system of government that treats us citizens as political equals and allows us to have a say in public affairs. It's also associated with important extrinsic benefits. Uh, democracies are associated with higher economic growth, less poverty and lower levels of violent conflict. So this is the reason that we have set up this uh, University of Amsterdam platform for democratic resilience. Uh, it's an initiative of three faculties, the Faculty of Law, the Faculty of Humanities and the Faculty of Social Sciences of the University of Amsterdam. Um, and the uh, platform will regularly organize lectures as well as stakeholder events and the aim is also to bring together researchers within the University of Amsterdam working on the health of democracy uh, and one of the ways as Matthijs already announced it is, uh, is our interdisciplinary research project uh, called the Identifying and Safeguarding Normative Foundations of Democracy where we study the acceptance uh, and erosion of democratic norms in Europe, Asia and North America. So we are very proud today that we are launching uh, this platform with a lecture by Anneline de Dijn uh, uh, on paranoid, the return of paranoid nationalism. So. And I want to introduce Anneline. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah well, sort of we, sh we should have practiced this better, uh, uh, Nick. Okay, well, I'm really very happy that today we have Anneline de Dijn, uh, one of the most eminent historians in the Netherlands. I can say millions of, uh, uh, give you a lot of uh, praise, but I will I keep it that you're a professor of uh, history at the University of Utrecht. Uh, and of course, your latest book, uh, an absolute bestseller, was uh, Freedom and Unruly History. A wonderful book, a uh, very brave book, where 2,000 years of, uh, of freedom uh, uh, has been given an overview. And it was actually quite rare, I think, for, for historians work, work, working in the Netherlands to address such a huge uh, topics. And you did, and I think it's becoming a real trend to do larger history again here in the Netherlands. And I think it also questions our idea of uh, freedom and our existing idea of uh, freedom. And what's interesting, and it's a very readable book, but it also uh, it learns, uh, it gives us a lot of insight in uh, contemporary um, uh, politics. Um, there's also a Dutch uh, translation of the book, uh, by the way. Uh, and I'm very glad you're going to shed your light uh, on uh, the Dutch, uh, I think, Dutch and European uh, political uh, situation uh, here today. So, Anneline, uh, just keep it short so you can have more time to speak. So, have, take a seat. 
On November 22nd of last year, Dutch citizens went to the polls. A nail-Biden campaign had pitted newcomers, such as Peter Omtzigt's new social contract and Caroline van der Plas's BBB, against incumbents such as the liberal VVD and the newly merged P van der Green Party. But to everyone's surprise, it was not the fresh faces of the NSC or BBB who obtained the crown. Instead, the far-right PVV became the largest party in the Netherlands, obtaining 23% of the vote. As of now, it seems highly likely that the PVV will be able to translate their electoral success into government participation. Thus, for the first time in its history, the Netherlands will be ruled by a coalition, including a party from the radical right, a party family characterized by virulent opposition to mig migration, xenophobia, and distrust of all forms of international cooperation. The political success of the radical right is not unique to the Netherlands. Over the past few decades, anti-immigrant parties have enjoyed increasing electoral support throughout Europe. Between 1995 and 2020, this party family tripled its vote share at the European level from 5% to 15%. This makes it the most successful new party family since the Second World War, as Kasmude has observed, more successful than green parties or parties like 50 plus who cater to pensioners. In addition, the radical right is also becoming more politically powerful. Over the past few years, radical right parties have increasingly been able to enter government through coalitions. Since October 2022, Italy is even led by a radical right wing prime minister, Giorgia Meloni. How can we understand the growing political success of the radical right in Europe? Much ink has been spilled on the subject, both in the popular media and in scientific literature. In this lecture, I will argue that while resentment theories fail to explain the rise of the radical right, it is also far too simplistic to understand the success of the radical right solely in terms of a backlash against mass migration. Instead, I will offer an alternative way of understanding the rise of the radical right by focusing on changes in European political culture. Notably, I will argue that before 2000, European political elites and publics were united in a strong anti-fascist consensus that effectively marginalized the radical right, but that this anti-fascist consensus started to crumble around 2000, thus opening up new opportunities for radical right parties. Attempts to explain the rise of the radical right in Europe have long tended to attribute the electoral success of parties such as the PVV to a general sense of resentment and malaise among marginalized citizens. In this view, a vote for the radical right must be seen as a protest vote, a vote against the established order, rather than as a vote in favor of its anti-immigrant program. This explanation for the rise of the radical right was first formulated several decades ago. One of the very first scholars to address the rise of the far right, the Swiss political scientist Hans-Georg Betz, argued in 1993 that the electoral success of parties like Vlaams Belang, Lega Nord, or the FPÖ came in what he called the wake of a profound and diffuse disaffection and disenchantment with established political parties throughout Western Europe. According to Betz, this disaffection was fueled in turn by long-term economic changes, including the demise of traditional blue-collar jobs and a shift to the tertiary sector. This had created Betz wrote, and I quote, a readily identifiable underclass of the permanently unemployed, underemployed, or marginally employed who are quickly turning into the losers of the accelerated modernization process. Understandably unhappy with their predicament, these losers of modernization went on to vote for anti-immigrant parties, thus giving a proverbial finger to the elite that had let them down. Betz's theory was quickly picked up by other scholars, as well as finding widespread acceptance in the media. Donald Trump's victory in the 2016 American presidential elections, for instance, was repeatedly attributed to his popularity among a white working class that had seen its position vis visibly deteriorate. More recently, this interpretation was strutted out again in the wake of the PVV's 2023 electoral victory. In the Groene Amsterdammer, 
Ewald, Ewald Engeland attributed the electoral results to, and I quote, the harm done by neoliberalism to the working classes. <laughs> but this explanation for the rise of the radical right holds up badly under closer scrutiny. Research shows that instead of appealing to an underclass, radical right parties tend to attract voters from different ends of the social economic spectrum. Both blue collar workers and entrepreneurs tend to vote for such parties. Indeed, Betts himself had had to admit in his 1993 article that the far right parties he studied in fact attracted plenty of voters from the middle class. He explained this away by arguing that middle class voters were attracted by other parts of the radical rights program, notably their anti-statism and commitment to low taxes. In addition, various studies show that few voters vote for the radical right because they feel economically insecure. Thus, voters of the PVV and similar parties are not typically motivated by a fear that they will lose their jobs to newcomers. Instead, they indicate that they want to protect their nation and culture against foreigners who are perceived as posing a threat to traditional norms and habits. In short, as Jota Magalit has recently argued in a survey of the literature, it seems fair to say that the explanatory significance of economic insecurity for the rise of populism or the radical right is modest. Indeed, some scholars have even argued that the opposite might be true. Um, thus, when the economy deteriorates, some scholars argue, the success of radical right parties tends to decrease because journalists pay less attention um, to um, uh, uh, themes typical uh, of radical rights, uh, parties such as migration and cultural wars, and instead focus on economic issues such as unemployment. That brings us to a second variant of what we may dub resentment theories. In this interpretive framework, the rise of the radical right is depicted as triggered not by wrenching economic change, uh, but as a response to a growing democratic deficit. In Ruling the Void, an influential book first published in 2013, political scientist Peter Mayer drew attention to major institutional changes that had led to a hollowing out of European democracies. Most notably, Mayer pointed out how in the 1980s and 1990s, former mass parties such as the Socialist and Christian Democrats lost more and more members. As a result, parliaments became increasingly dominated by professional politicians disconnected from the rest of society. These trends were further exacerbated, Mayer argued, by the growing power of the EU, which hampered democratic decision-making on the national level. Building on Mayer's work, several scholars began to argue that the rise of the radical right must be understood as a response to this democratic deficit. This interpretation was supported by the fact that parties such as the PVV or the Rassemblement National typically pose as anti-establishment parties. They claim to speak for the common man and they decry established parties as out of touch elites. As a result, scholars such as the German-American political scientist Jan Werner Müller attributed the rise of radical right parties whom he dubbed populist parties, to the technocratic way in which the European Union tackled the debt crisis in 2010. That crisis, Mueller argued, fueled anti-elite sentiments that resulted in the growing electoral success of parties such as the German AFD. Like the economic malaise thesis, this second explanatory model remains popular in the media. For example, Sociologist Roy Kemmers argued in the Volkskrant that Willer's victory on November 22nd can be attributed to years of structural dissatisfaction with politics. But most scholars now tend to agree that this reading of the rise of the radical right is untenable. If voters were mainly motivated by anger about the democratic deficit, you would expect that parties that combine anti-elitism with more left-wing positions would be at least equally successful as radical right parties. After the financial crisis of 2008, such a left-wing populist surge briefly seemed to be in the making, spearheaded by parties such as the Spanish Podemos. But those parties soon collapsed or lost their explicitly anti-elitist character. More systematic research by political scientists such as the Norwegian professor Elisabeth Ivers Flaten also shows that anti-elite positions in themselves do not attract voters unless linked to an anti-migration agenda. 
In short, a quarter century of research by political scientists has led to the fairly unsurprising conclusion that voters of radical right parties are motivated, are attracted by the program of these parties, in particular by their anti-immigration and xenophobic viewpoints. Voters tend to vote for radical right-wing parties not because they feel ignored by elites or because they are dissatisfied with their economic position. Instead, they are attracted to the ideology of these parties. A vote for the radical right can be understood not so much as a protest vote, but as a vote in favor of a certain program, um, of the anti-migration program. That makes it tempting to depict the emergence of the radical right as a straightforward response to the rise of mass migration to Europe. From the 1960s to the 1990s, hundreds of thousands of people migrated from non-Western countries to Europe, initially as guest workers, later mainly in the context of family reunification. When it became increasingly clear that these migrants were not here as temporary workers, but were taking root in Europe with their families, this created a backlash that gave the radical right its first successes in countries such as Belgium, France, and Austria. Yet this interpretation, which we might term the backlash thesis, also leaves many questions unanswered. While there's clearly a link between mass migration and the rise of anti-immigrant sentiment and hence the radical right, the relationship between both is not as linear as it might seem at first sight. As Larry Bartles, for instance, has pointed out, viewpoints about migration in Europe have barely budged over the last 20 years. If anything, Europeans have become more sanguine about mi migration. Thus, the European Social Value Survey shows that of the 15 countries represented in all nine ESS rounds, 13 became warmer towards immigrants. Only two countries, Hungary and Poland, experienced a decline in average ratings. And yet, in this same period, electoral support for the radical right increased substantially, tripling from about 5% of the European electorate to nearly 15%. In short, while resentment theories fail to explain the rise of the radical right, it is also far too simplistic to depict the success of radical right parties solely as a result of a backlash against mass migration. In the remainder of this lecture, I will therefore propose an alternative framework that focuses on changes in European political culture to make sense of the rise of the radical right. And by political culture, I mean the widely shared norms and beliefs that regulate the political behavior of elites, such as elected politicians, administrators, and journalists, as well as of politically active members of the public. Building on work by Dan Stone and other historians of post-war Europe, I will suggest that the radical right's growing prominence is closely related to the demise of the anti-fascist consensus that long characterized European political culture. So what I'll do in the remainder of this lecture is explain how this post-war anti-fascist consensus came into being in the wake of World War II, how it hampered the growth of the radical right in Europe in the 1980s and 1990s, and how it crumbled after 2000, thus opening up new opportunities for the radical right. After the defeat of Nazi Germany in 1945, Western European political elites wanted to forget about the painful war years and focus on rebuilding. This was certainly true in West Germany and Italy, but it was also the case in countries such as France and the Netherlands that had been occupied by the Germans. After a brief period of retribution against traitors and collaborators, amnesties were declared and life went on. To the extent that they reflected on the victims of the Second World War, Europeans focused on their own national suffering and heroic resistance against the Germans. Yet in the 1960s and 1970s, as a new generation came of age, these comfortable myths started being questioned. As a result, the Nazi persecution of minorities, and especially the Jews, gained new prominence in public debate. In addition, more attention started being paid to the role of non-German states and citizens in the persecution of the Jews. These developments gave rise to a pan-European anti-fascist consensus, and this anti-fascist consensus in turn had an important impact on a political culture 
of Western European states, creating strong opposition to radical right parties. This is perhaps best illustrated by the German case. In West Germany, a strongly self-critical memory culture emerged in the 1960s and 1970s, focusing on collective German responsibility for the Second World War and the Holocaust. The generation that then came of age had no memory of the Nazi past, but became aware of the outrages committed by their parents and grandparents through the work of historians and through court cases against the war criminals. The trial of Adolf Eichmann in Jerusalem in 1961 was an important watershed in the development of the new memory culture. Eichmann, a high-ranking Nazi official, had been responsible for the planning of the end losing or final solution. After the war, he had managed to escape to Argentina, where he lived quietly under an alias. In 1960, however, he was detained in Buenos Aires by the Israeli Secret Service and brought to Jerusalem for a months-long trial. During this trial, prosecutors painstakingly reconstructed how Eichmann and other Nazi officials had planned and executed the final solution. The trial was widely supported and reported in the international and German press, thus heightening for the first time awareness about the persecution of the Jews by the Nazis. Popular movies, documentaries, and TV series further perpetuated that awareness. The American miniseries Holocaust was watched by no less than one-third of the West German population when it aired on television in 1979. And the broadcaster was inundated with people expressing their shock and horror at what they had seen. In the 1980s, historians such as Ernst Nolte tried to change this dark view of the German history by arguing that the Holocaust was comparable to other atrocities such as Stalin's mass murders. In a subsequent historic strike fought out in newspapers and media, he received stiff resistance from other German historians. And ultimately, Nolte found himself completely isolated with his view of the Nazi past. This memory culture, with its emphasis on contrition and collective guilt, had a major impact on German politics. There was no room for nationalist or xenophobic parties, which were associated with the Nazi past. The Republikaner, a virulent nationalist party found in 1983 and led by a former member of the Waffen-SS, were vilified by all other politicians, as David Arth has shown. Left-wing politicians and activists missed no opportunity to express their disgust with the uh, Republikaner. They protested at REP meetings, harassed and peace from this party, and sometimes threatened violence. Perhaps even more strikingly, the conservative CDU, CSU, adopted a strict policy of marginalization called Ausgrenzung towards the REP. Party leader Edmund Stoiber explained that such a policy was necessary because of the REP's similarity to Nazi demagoguery. Ausgrenzung prohibited personal contact with REP politicians, reliance on REP votes to pass legislation and support for any REP candidate or proposal. This occurred at every political level. Even party members in communal parliaments, not normally known for their ideological battles, were instructed to vote against the most mundane proposals of REP politicians, such as the installation of a traffic light. This strategy of isolating the REP, it bears emphasizing, was quite successful. After initial breakthroughs in several state legislatures in the late 1980s and early 1990s, the REP won only 2.5% um, of the vote in the national elections of 1994 and thereafter became irrelevant. In other Western European countries such as France, the Netherlands or Belgium, which had been victims of Nazi occupation, a critical memory culture was slower to develop. But here too, the coming of age of the boomer generation meant that more attention began to be paid to the persecution of the Jews and other minorities as well as to the contribution of their own states and citizens to the Holocaust. In the Netherlands, for instance, the immediate post-war period saw the development of a memory culture in which the suffering of the Dutch nation held central stage. The murder of more than 100,000 Dutch Jews received a place in this nationalistic memory culture, 
But the evil was seen to have come from outside, and the role of the Dutch state or Dutch citizens in the deportation of the Jews remained largely unmentioned. Yet this comforting narrative started being questioned in the 1960s. A key role in this process was played, as Frank van Vree has shown in a recent book, by the publication of Downfall or Ondergang, a two-volume study of the persecution of Dutch Jews by Jacques Presser. Presser, a Jewish historian who had survived the Second World War in hiding, but who had lost his beloved wife as well as his sister and a large number of friends and family, wrote a deeply personal account of the persecution of the Dutch Jews, highlighting Dutch complicity with the destruction of the Jewish community. Yet, Presser's book was a commercial and critical success. Receiving rave reviews, its first print run of 11,000 copies was sold out in a few days, and within a year, it sold 140,000 copies. Like in the German case, the gradual emergence of a self-critical memory culture in the Netherlands resulted in a strong response to radical right parties uh, like, for instance, the Centrum Partij that emerged in the 1980s. When Hans-Jan Maat, the leader of the Centrum Party, was elected in 1982, other politicians refused to collaborate with him in any way. Jan Maat was also socially isolated. He was given a seat by himself in the House of Representatives because no one wanted to sit next to him, and most of his colleagues even refused to shake his hand. In addition, Jan Maat and his party were opposed by civil society organizations such as the Anne Frank Stichting, which repeatedly initiated legal proceedings, uh, proceedings against the CP for discrimination. Journalists devoted considerable attention to Jan Maat and his party, so the CP was by no means silenced. But this attention was mostly negative. Every electoral success of the CP or the CD was met with agonized questions about the return of fascism. Again, this strategy proved very effective. In the 1980s, the Centre Party and its successor never received more than one seat in the national parliament. In 1994, the Centre Democrats obtained 2.4% of the vote, resulting in three seats, its largest electoral success. But all three seats were lost during the next elections of 1998, and the party failed to re-enter parliament. Similarly, in France and Belgium, the anti-fascist consensus resulted in a cordon sanitaire around radical right parties. When Jean-Marie Le Pen, the leader of the National Front, unexpectedly came second in the 2002 presidential elections, massive anti-Front um, National demonstrations took place, drawing out more than 1.3 million French people. The conservative candidate Jacques Chirac subsequently defeated Le Pen with an astonishing 82% of the vote. Not all Western European countries, it's important to note, developed such a strongly self-critical memory culture. In Austria, for instance, the Second Republic was founded on the myth that the Austrians had been the first victims of Nazi Germany, the so-called Opfer Theory. The 1938 Anschluss was proclaimed an act of military aggression and therefore the newly revived Austria of 1945 could not and should not be considered responsible for the Nazis' crimes in any way even though large members, uh, numbers of Austrians had been active members of the Nazi party. For decades, the victim theory remained a fundamental myth in Austrian society. It was only in 1986 that the debate was triggered about the Austrian past in the wake of the Waldheim scandal. This scandal was triggered when the conservative politician Kurt Waldheim ran for the office of president and became clear that he might have participated in war crimes during his time in the Wehrmacht. The ensuing debate eventually led the Austrian state to officially abandon victim theory, and many younger Austrians followed suit. At the same time, an older generation continued to hold on to this myth. In a March 1988 poll, Austrians under 30 were evenly divided on the question of whether Austria was a victim of the Anschluss or its accomplice, whereas for those over 50, the status of victim was selected by nearly twice as many as those who assign blame. The long-lasting influence of the victim myth in Austrian politics can help us to understand why radical right parties in that country were far more successful than in neighboring West Germany. A few years after the Waldheim scandal, uh, 
Jorik Haider's radical right freedom party obtained 22% of the vote in the national elections. And uh, Haider's party subsequently went on to become even more successful, despite Haider praising former members of the Waffen-SS as decent people. In 1999, the Freedom Party became the second largest party in Austria behind the Socialists. Even though the Socialists refused to form a government with Haider's party, <laughs> the conservative Christian Democrats had less qualms and, and entered into a coalition with the Freedom Party, again in marked contrast to their German counterparts. Similarly, in Italy, a self-critical memory culture was slow to develop. Here, the homegrown fascism of Benito Mussolini was contrasted positively with German Nazism, leading to a tendency to marginalize or even silence debate about collaboration and Italian anti-Semitism. Up until today, an image of Italy persists as a safe haven for Jews, and of the Italians as brava gente, good people, instinctively opposed to anti-Semitism. Unsurprisingly, Italy was the first European country where a party with links to fascism became part of the government, when a neo-fascist MSI entered into a coalition government headed by Silvio Berlusconi in 1994. In short, there were important national differences in the development of memory cultures in Western Europe, differences that can be linked to the greater or lesser success of radical right parties, both electorally and pol politically. While West German memory culture emphasized contrition and collective guilt for the Holocaust and hence fostered strong resistance against radical right parties, this was less true for historically contingent reasons of other perpetrator nations such as Austria and Italy. Countries like France, Belgium, and the Netherlands, on the other hand, developed a political culture more similar to that of West Germany, embracing a strong anti-fascist consensus. I would like to conclude this overview of the development of political culture in post-war Europe between 1945 and 2000 with a brief reflection on the situation in communist Eastern Europe, which was obviously quite different from that in the West. In the East, post-war memory culture did not develop bottom-up as in Western Europe. It was imposed from above by Moscow. As a result, the Second World War was remembered very differently in the East from the way it was in the West. While the Soviets and their puppet regimes they rejected Nazism and fascism just as vehemently as their counterparts in the West, they tended to understand fascism very differently as an outgrowth of capitalism. Hence, Marxist orthodoxy placed the Jewish question on the margins of the class struggle and viewed anti-Semitism primarily as a tool to divide the working class rather than as a belief system with autonomous and widespread impact. East German history textbooks, for instance, displaced responsibility for the Second World War to capitalist Germany and portrayed the East German people as victims of this fascist seduction. As we shall see next, the peculiarities of this Eastern European memory culture would continue to have a major impact on political culture in Eastern Europe long after the demise of the Soviet Union. After 2000, the anti-fascist consensus began to wane in Western Europe. To a certain extent, the passing of time played a role as the Second World War receded further into the past. But even more importantly, other benchmarks emerged for collective memory. In particular, the events of 9-11 and the subsequent jihadist attacks in Europe have to a certain extent replaced the memory of the Second World War and the Holocaust as a central reference point shaping European political culture. These events, which took place when my generation come of, came of age, the generation of 40 and 50 somethings that is now unfortunately in charge, has sparked new narratives counteracting <coughs> the lessons from the Holocaust. In particular, 9-11 has taught many of us to think of the threat of violent extremism as coming from the outside, from foreign Islamic terrorists, rather than from the inside, from homegrown fascists. The impact of 9-11 and other jihadist attacks on Western European political culture is perhaps most clearly illustrated by the Dutch case. Here, as I had earlier argued, a strong memory culture had emerged, centering the Holocaust and acknowledging Dutch complicitly with the destruction of its Jewish community. In the 1980s and 1990s, this memory culture contributed in an important way to the marginalization of parties such as the Center Party um, and the Center Democrats that were considered fascist. 
In the late 1990s, the rise to prominence of Pim Fortuyn was greeted with similar moral abhorrence. Even though Fortuyn was less easy to peg as a fascist due to his gayness and flamboyant lifestyle, his radical statements about Islam eventually proved too controversial even for his own party, Leefbaar Nederland. LN's executive committee dismissed Fortuyn right before the 2002 elections after he stated in an interview with the um, local newspaper, the Volkskrant, that the Islam was a retarded religion um, as well as proposing to close the border for asylum seekers. Yet when both Fortuyn and the anti-Islam agitator Theo van Gogh were murdered in the early aughts, the anti-fascist consensus rapidly crumbled. Violent extremism was now no longer associated with homegrown fascism. It was seen as coming from the outside and more particularly from the Muslim world. To the extent that there were in still internal enemies, these were now seen to be on the left of the political spectrum, in a remarkable reversal from earlier views. When Peter Langendam, the LPF's new leader, claimed that the bullet that killed Fortuyn was fired by the left, many agreed. As a result, the marginalization strategies that had kept the radical right in check were abandoned. When, in the wake of Fortuyn's murder, the LPF obtained 17% of the vote, there was no question that it would not participate in a newly formed government. Of course, lack of a political experience and talent meant that the LPF quickly collapsed. But only a few years later, a newly formed radical right party, the PVV, took over the LPF's role, um, going on to support Max uh, Rutte's uh, first government. The Dutch case, it must be noted, is atypical with regard to the speed and comprehensiveness of the breakdown of the post-war anti-fascist consensus. In other Western European countries, that consensus crumbled more slowly um, uh, and more gradually. Nevertheless, throughout Europe, the radical right is becoming increasingly less marginalized, as is illustrated by the growing number of countries where radical right parties have participated in coalition governments. In Eastern Europe, the demise of the post-war anti-fascist consensus has been even more dramatic. As I mentioned earlier, the Eastern European embrace of anti-fascism did not develop bottom-up, as in Western Europe, but was imposed from above by Moscow. After the demise of the Soviet Union, these top-down imposed memory cultures were widely rejected. In most countries of the former East Bloc, the fall of the Iron Curtain was accompanied by a rapid delegitimization of former state-sponsored national master narratives. In the wake of 1989, fascist politicians and movements from the interwar period have regained legitimacy. Marshal Antonescu, to give but one example, the wartime Romanian leader who was ex executed in June 1945, defended himself at his trial with the claim that he had sought to protect his country from the Soviet Union. He's now being rewritten into Romanian popular history as a hero. He sparred in a massacre of Jews and others in wartime Romania, weighing little in the balance against his anti-Russian credentials. This can help us to understand, I would like to suggest, why the radical right has made such rapid advances in post-communist states such as Hungary, Poland, or Slovakia. In these state, states, radical right-wing parties such as Fidesz, um, PIS and Smer routinely obtain more than 40% of the vote, making them not just junior coalition partners, but the main governing parties. That brings me to the end of this lecture. What I have tried to show is that the rise of the radical right cannot just be seen as a result of a backlash against immigration. The growing success of parties like the PVV is also, to an important degree, a result of changes in our political culture of the breakdown of the anti-fascist consensus that played such a huge role shaping our collective norms and values in the post-war period. What does that bode for the future? The waning of the post-war taboo on fascism is probably irreversible. For decades, the memory of the Second World War inoculated on, uh, against more virulent forms of nativism. But this vaccine now seems to have worn off even in Germany, where the AfD could well become the second largest party. Attempts to restore the original post-war consensus by, for instance, paying more attention to the history of the Second World War and the Holocaust and secondary education seem to me to have little, success of, uh, to have little chance of success and may even be counterproductive. 
A self-critical memory culture cannot be manufactured, but must grow from below. But that doesn't mean that the rise of the radical right um, has become unstoppable. The fact that the anti-fascist consensus has disappeared should not lead us to think that the radical right's views cannot be countered at all. It just means we'll have to work harder to explain why their xenophobic program is objectionable and even morally abhorrent. It is no longer enough to use the label fascism to discredit radical right-wing positions or politicians. Instead, we need to invest more energy in developing a clear and coherent critique of the radical rights program on both factual and ethical grounds. Thank you, uh, Anneline, for this sweeping and uh, radical reinterpretation uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, the, of the rise of the radical uh, right. Uh, we have two uh, very uh, esteemed uh, commentators. I will introduce them uh, subsequently. Uh, first, uh, Tamar de Waal, who is an associate professor of uh, illegal theory here also at the University of Amsterdam. She's also director of the Amsterdam Honors College of Law, but she's also a public lawyer, uh, having a column in the Groene and very uh, often very present in uh, the, uh, the, the, the contemporary debates on democracy, civic education, and integration policies and migration. Our second uh, esteemed commentator is from the social sciences, uh, political sciences, uh, faculty. Um, Matthijs Roduin is an associate professor uh, in political science. Uh, his research uh, focuses already, he has been studying uh, the, the far right already for many years and what you have seen is that from a rather eccentric topic, this has become a very uh, a topic which has been growing and growing in importance and he has had many uh, uh, seminal uh, uh, publications. So first uh, Tamar and then uh, Matthijs. Uh. All right. So thank you very much for the invitation and uh, being allowed to respond to Annalene's valuable essay in the Groen Amsterdammer and uh, the lecture. Um, I basically entirely agree with Annalene. So <laughs> about the fact that people who vote for parties like the PVV broadly agree with the views of these parties. And the thing I have to, I have to navigate in the next 10 minutes a bit, is that your essay was on paranoid nationalism and you actually did not use that term in this lecture today. But I think you mean broadly the same with the waning of the anti-fascist consensus in Europe. So I wanna focus in the next 10 minutes on um, why the current time seem more prone again to support for radical right party, so you could call it paranoid nationalism. Because I also agree with um, uh, Annaline that this seems to be the case and also that the type of political views that the PVV has are not unfamiliar for Europe. So th it is something that's, that we have seen in the past and something that we see on the rise today. So I think that was also in the essay and also in, in her lecture today. But I think that the whole story is not that the Second World War happened, then there was a certain consensus, and that consensus is waning again. I think that's not the whole story. And so I'm gonna share some thoughts about history and how we um, uh, are dealing with the past, and I will broadly focus on the Netherlands. And my research uh, or my, these thoughts stem from my current research on how to cultivate citizenship in a liberal democratic society. So, for instance, in schools, but also much broader, right? How do we uphold these values, not only in our institutions, but also something that we support together? And um, in this, I try to think through, amongst other things, what the right national self-image is and also what the right personal image is. So the more civic identity of citizens. How should we see our citizenship? How should we support liberal democracy? And I think increasingly that dealing with the past in the right way is an important aspect of this. So how a country sees itself in relation to its past but also individual citizens. And given that this is where my research is leading me recently, I read a lot of history now. And I'm aware that Annelies and Matthijs here both are the real historians in this room. So bear with me 
So think of me as a legal philosopher who is sharing some tentative insights while trying to do interdisciplinary research. So again, I think the explanation that this consensus is waning is not the whole story. For instance, you actually also mentioned this, and I'm also looking at Matthijs for this, there's quite a lot of political science research that shows that support for the radical right or radical right views or nativist views, paranoid nationalism views, are and have been relatively structurally present in, for instance, the Netherlands, but also other European countries. But that this reservoir, as Larry Bertels calls it, you also mentioned him, has not always been tapped through history or through the last decades, over the last decades, because during elections, migration issues or nativism issues were not always politicized, meaning they were not the topics people depended their vote on. So it's not necessarily that they didn't agree with these views, but they didn't decide whose party they were voting for based on these views. So maybe other topics were more important to them. And interestingly, so this is in, ad in addition to this fact, one of my key findings now is that in the Netherlands, since the Second World War, we have actually underinvested in cultivating knowledge about liberal democracy, the democratische rechtsstaat, and we underinvested in making sure that commitment to the underlying principles of the constitutional state were uh, uh, inculcated in society through knowledge, but also perhaps through explaining why it is important that we have this system. And I say paradoxically because you would think that if there would be a time to look the beast in the mouth, and I'm not quite sure whether this is an English saying, <laughs> that this would have been the post-war period. right? <coughs> so a period after total destruction, genocide, betrayal, and collaboration. And by that beast and that mouth, I mean thinking through with an extreme sense of urgency about the educational, habitual, cultural, and societal conditions for the democratic rule of law, the democratische rechtsstaat, as well as how to ensure its persistence. So as Annelien also said, every country has its own historical developments and also culture of remembrance with, re with regarding the Second World War. So if we focus on the Netherlands, I think the Netherlands is also an interesting case because it's par excellence a country that for decades thought of itself that it was at the forefront of the march towards more human rights. And saw it, we saw ourselves as a uniquely rule of law country. And I was a child in the 90s, and I can even recall that feeling, right? That what the Netherlands, or what we thought we were. And yet today we have to conclude that it doesn't really appear to be the case, right? So how can this be? As Annelien also mentioned, to answer this question, we should not forget that after the Second World War, there was not immediately a lot of attention for things like human rights. At least the Netherlands did not see a contradiction between signing all kinds of treaties that mentioned universal rights and starting an extremely brutal colonial war in Indonesia. And in addition, after the Second World War, there was very limited attention for the Holocaust and the returning victims. Annelien also elaborated on this. And I think this lack of attention ha has many reason, uh, uh, reasons, but while reading the interesting work by Aleida Asman, and she writes about collective memory and forms of forgetting, she says that in the post-war uh, period, there was a great need to repress the memory of the Second World War. So she says sometimes forgetting is not always a form of repression, but also a form of relief. For example, also for more political reasons, the British Prime Minister Winston Churchill argued in a speech in 1964 that Europe had to rebuild itself from the blast act of oblivion. <laughs> 
because only then, in his view, so by forgetting the Second World War, in a way, Europe could rebuild itself and was possible to bring Germany and Italy back into the European family. And what Asman shows is that an act of forgetting that helps you in one period, or at least keeps you going, so in a period of reconstruction, the Wederopbouw, for instance, can become your biggest weakness in a later period of time, like a boomerang banging in your face. So in her book, Der Europäische Traum, so a German uh, essay, she writes that Europe currently needs to engage in unforgetting. And with this she means that Europe has to face that it has a distorted collective historical self-image, which currently leaves us defenseless against its darkest tendencies, including its tendencies towards phasism. And I think a similar conclusion can be drawn in the uh, successful book by uh, Geraldine Swartz, in which is titled Those Who Forget. As Annaline also mentioned, attention for the Holocaust did grow later in the 20th century, strikingly enough through popular culture. But I think it's important to recognize that this attention came at a time when a great belief in progress had also taken root in Europe including the Netherlands. It was the time the Berlin Wall came down and of Fukuyama's thesis of the end of history. So we were now forever liberal and forever democratic <laughs> and the rest of the world would eventually be too. This whole stance in itself, of course, already makes one lazy and naive. It does not encourage self-reflection if you're on an inevitable path towards more liberal democracy. It does not trigger constant self-criticism. It actually makes you self-congratulatory and leads to feelings of superiority because you're ahead now. But it's important to also understand that it also is a form of forgetting the Second World War. Well, at the same time, the Holocaust became more central in our uh, collective consciousness. So another paradox. Tony Judd wrote about this paradox in his book, which I believe is titled The Forgotten 20th Century, in which he says the 20th century was, in a way, forgotten before it ended. Remember my 90s feeling. So Judd's point is nuanced. Of course, Europe was and is, in a way, full of the last century and the Second World War in terms of references, attention in the media, books, culture, commemorations, but it is a certain kind of history that is represented resting on the idea, after much horrors, great lessons have been learned by us, and now, as a result, we are uniquely enlightened and free. So in, with this idea, the 20th century was closed off in a certain way and placed at a distance from now and us today. So this type of remembering fully acknowledges that it was terrible in the Second World War and also institutional apologies can be made for that. However, it also puts a thick line under this past. We are a country and a continent that has learned from the past and we are inherently better now. So I could go on for a while, for instance, about the historical strijd in the Netherlands, you also mentioned some authors, but also about Dutch education that mostly portrays the Second World War as something that happened to us as a time of uh, uh, occupation. It also only focused on 4045, never about the 30s, never about general <coughs> mechanisms of exclusion or the possibility of the erosion of the rule of law through democratic means. It also hardly covers periods of, of history in which the Netherlands was even more obviously culpable, such as, for instance, in our slave, uh, slavery past. But I'll stop here. So the point that I want to make is that we should realize that the Netherlands, after the Second World War, has not spent that much time, effort, and thinking in how should we uphold the democratic rule of law not only in an institutional way, but also in a societal way. 
we have not developed strong public discourses on this. We hardly embedded any citizenship lessons in education. Only in 2021, there was a, like a new policy that mandated schools to educate citizenship, etc. Dutch teens know little about the rule of law and democracy, turns out over and over again, and I think it's not much better among adults. <coughs> and if there was a political topic in recent history that triggered public discussions on citizenship, Dutch identity, and Dutch history, it has been the topic of migration and integration. And I believe that within this debate, a perspective on Dutch citizenship emerged that resonates with the idea of paranoid nationalism, so the idea that the Dutch are under threat by those who have to integrate. And I think that perspective even perhaps has been cultivated more strongly than a uh, uh, perspective on citizenship that is fully in line with the constitutional democratic state. So unfortunately, I have to end with a pessimistic <laughs> conclusion that in the year 2024, while the radical right is, is on the rise, we have to conclude that we actually suffer from overdue maintenance regarding societal knowledge and support for the constitutional democratic state and its core principles and norms. And generating support in this stage is not that easy because it's something that needs long-term investment and can only grow through time. Therefore, I think that presenting a counter-narrative by just explaining why certain things are politically or empirically incorrect might not be successful because this has to land in a more societal ethos that is open for that and which has been cultivated through times, inclu including ideas about the present and perspectives on history. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to uh, disappoint you because I agree with both of you. Uh, so this is going to be very boring. Uh, no, um, um, what I'm going to do, um, I would like to maybe uh, rephrase the puzzle that both of you have already mentioned. Um, and then I'm going to, and I think I agree with, um, well, your idea about that, well, no, I'll go back, I, I, I get back to that later, but what I will do is I will try to provide uh, two or three alternative explanations. Not alternative, but additional explanations, I have to say, for the reason why the radical right has become more successful in the last couple of decades. Um, so I think the big, the big puzzle here is, and you have already show, uh, shown it, right? So these parties have become much more successful. So in the 1990s, they were supported by about 5% of the electorate, and now it's somewhere between 20 and 25% of the electorate on average in Europe. In the Netherlands, the far right is supported by 30 to 35% of the electorate. So here they are more uh, successful than in most other countries, not well, except for some uh, Central and Eastern Europe, uh, European countries. Um, but the big puzzle, I think, is we know that people who vote for these parties are mostly people who are dissatisfied with immigration, uh, people who want a more restrictive immigration policy. They tend to vote for these parties. Um, but as you have argued, um, and you as well, um, attitudes about immigration have not really changed in the last couple of decades. And what has changed is that they have become slightly more positive on average. So this can never be the explanation of the rise of the radical right. There has to be something else. Um, and that is the puzzle I think you wanted, to, you tried to solve, and you as well to some extent, by uh, providing the alternative framework of your political cultural approach, right? The demise of, anti, of the anti-fascist consensus. And I do agree, I think this is a very important reason why the people who were maybe to some extent predisposed to these parties have eventually indeed made, made the switch and actually voted for them. That has probably to do with this uh, political cultural change. Um, but I think there has, uh, it's important to emphasize a couple of other things that have happened. Um, so I think this, right, this, this, this Bartel story that, that, that you both have mentioned, there is this, uh, the, the ideas haven't really changed, but support for these parties has. 
Um, I think what is really important to understand, it, understand this development is to take also into account the parties themselves. So we haven't really talked much about them yet, and I think that is really important. What has, ha what has happened, I think, is that the radical right parties have changed. Their core message is still the same as just after the Second World War. Uh, the core message is what political scientists and sociologists call nativism, uh, which is basically the idea that your nation is being threatened by dangerous others. And these others can be different groups. They can be uh, uh, Jews, they can be immigrants, they can be Muslims, they can be refugees, they can be all kinds of different groups. But they threaten the nation state. And that was and still is the core message of the radical right. In addition, all of these parties are authoritarian. So they basically want a very strictly ordered society where people who break the law are punished severely. That is something that back then and right now all these parties share with each other. Maybe the form is a bit different, but the core is still this. What these parties have done is they have changed the way in which they have presented this. So back in the days it was fascism, it was racism, it was anti-Semitism. Now it's less of that. Anti-Semitism is, is increasing again but on average it's more directed towards immigrants. But what is even more important is that these parties try to embrace something like a democratic edus. They, they try to uh, uh, um, embrace democracy to a large extent and also they try to present themselves as the real Democrats. And they did so by, by, uh, by embracing populism, uh, arguing that there is an evil elite that doesn't listen to ordinary citizens. Um, and they, the, the leaders of these parties, argue that they are the actual, well, leaders who know what ordinary people find important. And therefore, they, 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 they really developed over the years this, this, this democratic, democratic image among many people. Um, also, they have a more moderate image because of this, um, but also because of very uh, 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 clear strategies of what, uh, what in French is dédiabolisation, which is basically making yourself look less like the devil, <laughs> maybe to, to, to translate it. Um, and that's true. They have a much more moderate image. That doesn't mean that they are more moderate, right? When you look at their policy proposals, they haven't really changed. But when you look at them, they have changed. Their image has changed. They are much more moderate among uh, uh, citizens. So that is something that they really have uh, tried to, to do. They have uh, um, th th their core strategy for many parties in the Netherlands and in France, for instance, was to make themselves look much more moderate, to become more attractive to a large part of the electorate. Um, what they also did to, 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 to uh, accomplish this goal was that they have diversified their ideology, their nativism. It's now also about gender ideology, it's about climate skepticism, uh, it's about uh, cultural Marxism, it's about the deep state, so they diversified their, their message. Um, so this is one part I wanted to emphasize, the parties themselves. Um, I think it's important in addition to what you have already mentioned uh, to, to, uh, to say something about. The other one is, um, you've also touched upon it, but um, um, I think there's more uh, to tell about that, and that is the behavior of right-wing, in particular right-wing mainstream parties. Um, these parties have legitimized uh, these parties to a large extent. What they have done uh, over the years, and we know that from research, is their policy positions, in particular when it comes to immigration, have moved closer to the policy positions of the radical right. So they have moved basically into their direction. And by doing that, they have legitimized what these parties argue. So that is their, the substance of uh, the, 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 the right, the, 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 their policy proposals, the substance of their ideologies. Um, but also when it comes to their behavior, they have normalized these parties. And I think what has happened in the Netherlands is really is, is, is a great example of this. Uh, only in the last six months, uh, the PVV of Geert Wilders has been strongly normalized. Um, if you go back six months, the PVV was the uh, party number five in the polls. Uh, 
um, it was supported by about 10% of the electorate. It was excluded from power. Uh, our, uh, the missionary prime minister did not want to talk to the PVV. It was really excluded from politics. Um, and that, of course, changed dramatically uh, in the last six months because of the elections and because of the government formation process right now. And it's really interesting that this party has changed from being a, a pariah only six months ago to uh, well, uh, a, 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 a partner, basically, to the mainstream parties of the right. So that is a change that has taken place in the last six months, but on average, the whole legitimization process is something that is, has been going on for uh, almost three decades. Um, the final point I wanted to emphasize is um, individualization. And I think this big process of individualization, depolarization in the Netherlands, um, it is really important to take that into account to understand what has happened. Because the, the political cultural uh, themes have, have, have changed, right? That is important. These parties themselves have changed. But also the electorate, their ideas has not really changed, but they have become available to these radical right parties. Before, uh, during polarization, right, in the Netherlands, but also in other countries, people were really loyal to the parties they had always voted for, the mainstream parties, conservatives, social democrats, um, um, uh, liberals. And that has, of course, really changed right now. It's really different. Um, people are not loyal to these parties anymore, and they have become available as an electorate to these radical right parties. Uh, so that is something I think we should also take into account. Um, finally, how much time do I have left? One minute. One minute. To close, <coughs> to close um, I think what you mentioned is really important. The, I think these parties, uh, to, to quite some extent, form a threat to liberal democracy. We know that when these parties participate in a, in, a, in, a, in a government coalition, on average, that is bad news for liberal democracy. The quality of liberal democracy decreases when these parties become part of a government coalition. And we also know from many examples that when these parties are the biggest parties uh, in a government coalition, that is even uh, worse news for liberal democracy. So I really, I think I really uh, support your, um, uh, your claim. I think what you argued, um, Annelien's story is not the whole story, but it's also important uh, to take into account that in the Netherlands we have a limited liberal democratic consciousness, so to say, and maybe we even have a false consciousness. That was not what you said, but <laughs> my, the words I, 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 I put on it, a false consciousness. And I, I think that is one of the biggest problems because from research we also know, research that we did within this project, that many people in the Netherlands, people also, um, mostly people who support uh, right-wing parties, their attitudes towards liberal democracy are not that liberal democratic very often. So I think it is really important and one of the tasks that we are, f we are very late, but I think not too late, but I think we really have to try to develop and uh, do some citizenship training to make people more liberal democratic. I think that is the best way to protect ourselves to unliberal parties. Thank you. No. <laughs> I'm sure when I touch it, oh no, it does, does, <laughs> does don't work. Don't, I won't push the button again. Okay, got it. <laughs> so, um, I, in response to what you said, Tom, I, um, I don't want to suggest, um, or I, I think you're right, we should be wary not to paint too rosy a picture of um, uh, the way our political culture worked before 2000. Um, yeah, obviously. Um, uh, the, uh, the, the fact that the memory culture and political culture in general that the uh, uh, Holocaust um, had such a, a really key place um, doesn't mean that uh, there, uh, you know, that there was a full and uh, complete commitment to uh, the values of liberal democracy. I mean, it doesn't necessarily mean it. Um, also, because there were many blind spots, uh, as you mentioned, um, uh, the history of Dutch colonialism, um, the uh, history of slavery. So those are uh, aspects of uh, the Dutch past that we've only much more recently started working through. Um, and you know, those were uh, really important blind spots. But uh, 
my claim is a more limited one. So it's not that um, um, uh, in the uh, 1990s we were all 100% uh, um, you know, terrific Democrats and uh, that, uh, you know, deeply committed to human rights, but I, I do think that, there, that the way in which political culture worked in the Netherlands and in Europe more broadly speaking uh, with some exceptions, um, as I've mentioned, uh, such as, for instance, uh, Austria, um, that um, there were norms and values in place that formed a more effective check um, against the rise of fascism, or against the rise of parties that, was then, that were then unproblematically termed fascist, right? I mean, that's another thing we no longer do. There's a huge... In the early 2000s, there was a huge debate um, amongst others in the countries in the Netherlands about the question whether we could call parties like uh, Les Bifurtuin or PVV fascist, and that debate has been lost by the people who were arguing that they should be called uh, fascist. Right? I think that's another symptom of this breakdown of the anti-fascist consensus. Um, so I, I do think that those norms and values um, I think that something real, that something important has been lost in that regard, in particular because the sort of the collective um, sort of the benchmarks that have b replaced these earlier benchmarks, and I'm thinking here in particular of 9/11, um, have created a political culture that is in many ways much less self-critical. I mean, there's no denying, and um, nobody was denying this. I mean, that was that was actually the, the key, one of the key arguments of the memory culture that emerged in the 70s and 80s, that fascism, um, even in non-German countries, was in many um, ways a homegrown European movement. And by focusing on um, the threat from I Islamic terrorism, we've really started, that's when you know, the smugness became even, yeah, that's when the smugness <laughs> became a real, a problem, and when we start, um, you know, focusing on threats from the outside rather than from potential extremism in our own societies. Um, and then, in response to what you just said, uh, Matthias, um, I completely agree with you. Um, we should look at, I mean, the behavior of um, radical right parties themselves. Uh, that is also uh, a key sort of um, element that can help us understand. Um, the increasing legitima legitimization of uh, these parties. Um, they've adopted many strategies to dissociate themselves from the fascist past, um, in some cases in response to um, uh, um, the fact that they had been um, uh, um, uh, uh, judged, veroordeeld, um, um, uh, that they had been convicted um, uh, for racism, uh, which is, for instance, was a case in uh, Flanders where the um, uh, Vlaams uh, Belang um, uh, was convicted and then changed it, its name and sort of cleaned up its act a little bit. Um, uh, so the fact that all of the, and also less of an emphasis on anti-Semitism and more of an emphasis on uh, Islamophobia, those are all sort of uh, uh, reasons um, that helped uh, these parties to dissociate themselves from the fascist path. But at the same time, I think what, uh, is, what is more important is this broader development uh, that I sketched, the breakdown of the anti-fascist consensus. You, you uh, mentioned an interesting word, uh, de-diabolisation, uh, so the de-demonization of the far right. Well, at a certain point, they didn't really need to invest that much work in de-demonization anymore because the demon had changed, right? The devil that we were afraid of was replaced um, used to be fascism, and then it became Islamic terrorism. So it was a lot. It became a lot easier for them to uh, to point a finger at um, uh, elsewhere. Um, but it, but but you're absolutely right. Um, other um, things were obviously at play as well. Okay. Well, there seems to be a lot of agreement here on this table, but this may not be true for our audience. So of course, uh, I will start with Eric van Rey. We can make a short round. I'm sure you all have opinions on these matters. Uh, Eric, you can kick off the discussion. Uh, yeah, thank you. Okay, we have a uh, uh, yeah, for yeah. Um, Thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, Annelien, um, you, but your, your point is that um, um, things like uh, migration, economic problems, and uh, cultural wars and so are perhaps less important than the breakdown of this anti-fascist consensus. Um, but I think there's one 
element lacking in the story, and that is to what uh, degree <coughs> does the ideological factor and fascism play a role for voters to vote on these parties? And I think this is very limited. Um, and it's the, if you see, if you look at the Dutch um, uh, parties, the PVV and Forum, then I think in the case of Forum, there is clearly a, a kind of fascist inspiration. These people read books like Evola and Spengler and so on. You see them really enjoying this. I don't see that in the in the PVV. And uh, I, I think for the voters, for, for a limited group of voters, fascist ideology is significant. And also the, the, the detabuization of it, they're, they're excited that they, this is once again, we can read this and talk about this. But for m most people, the other things like um, the migration and culture wars and so are the main points. I think maybe room for two more questions. I don't know, uh, people are... Uh I see one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Okay, so I see three, and then we can come back to the audience, to the panel. Yes, it's more a question. What, what didn't come forward at all so far is, is the role of media, and in particular social media. So it's much easier for people now to spread their ideas and, through the internet. Is that something that plays a role in all of this? And then maybe two more at the back, and then we can. Oh, now, now it keeps coming. I, uh, the audience is warming. My question is actually very similar. Um, um, I'm originally from Portugal, which just had elections two weeks ago, unfortunately. The far right is now the third biggest uh, party there, um, but it is also one. It was also one of the elections with the least abstention rates in the past 20 years, um, which meant that a lot of people voted. And the media does say that the fact that that happened is because of social media. That there were so many young people voting this time, comparing to previous years. So I, I would like to know if, if in your research social media ever came up as one of the reasons why um, um, the far right is rising. Okay, maybe an answer uh, from our panel and I can go back to the... Um, okay, so, um, yeah, thank you so much for these uh, questions. So, um, um, I, I research shows um, fairly clearly that um, ideology matters uh, to voters of radical right parties, even to PVV voters. Although we might, you know, I, I think what you're uh, pointing at, Eric, is that um, we might not perceive uh, the points of view of this party as ideology in the sense that they're um, uh, maybe not based on an extensive reading of uh, Hegel or Marx, but, you know, they have a coherent worldview. And that worldview says that the Netherlands is under threat, our nation is under siege, uh, it's threatened by a fifth column. That fifth column is um, our Islamic fellow citizens, and they're in cahoots with international elite. And do, you know that those are sort of out to get the Netherlands. That is that is the ideology of the uh, PVV. And we can think it's absurd, it's paranoid. I you know I think it's paranoid. It's demonstrably untrue, but it is a coherent worldview. And we also know from research. Um, that voters that vote for the PVV tend to vote for the PVV because they are attracted to this worldview. They think it's true, just like voters for green parties are attracted to, are uh, motivated to vote for green parties because they agree with uh, the idea that climate change is an existential threat to humanity. So, um, yeah. Uh, and then the question, but then the question becomes, um, I, yeah, there's why this, why is there so much more, um, uh, why, why are the parties like this gaining in political power? Uh, why are they attracting more voters? And, why? and so that is the question I was trying to answer. But the premise is indeed, uh, yes, we need to accept that voters that vote for radical right parties uh, tend to be motivated by anti-immigrant um, uh, anti, uh, views. Um, then in response to the uh, questions about social media, um, that is not my line of research. I'm actually looking at Matthijs. He, I'm sure you know more about this than I do, Matthijs. Um, I did read an interesting uh, study recently 
suggesting that um, there, were, there were actually changes taking place in the media landscape uh, before uh, the emergence of social media. Um, uh, so the argument is that um, even before the emergence of social media, the, the uh, media landscape that had been controlled by uh, political parties who sort of use it to send top down uh, in their message to, uh, to citizens, um, that the liberalization of the media market um, ensured that um, media start playing a completely different role. It was more, um, what, you know, what do people want to see? So it became more focused on sensationalism and the argument is that this is a, was a contributing factor to the rise of the radical right. And I, you know, I'm, I'm, that seems plausible to me. I'm willing to uh, believe this, but I don't think it's the end all and be all uh, that can help us explain uh, why the radical right uh, became so successful. And that brings me to a larger point. And the larger point is that I think we should st stop focusing so much on voters and on what voters do and, and think. Um, because one really key other question is um, what, what do um, political elites uh, do and how are they motivated to... I mean, an, in, an example um, that I think um, illustrates how important... Um, uh, things like 9-11 have been is Martin Bosma uh, claims that this event, which he um, witnessed, uh, apparently he was living in the US uh, at the time of the um, uh, attacks on the Twin Towers, that this event motivated him to start working for um, uh, what eventually became the uh, PVV. So that's, that's why, um, you know, and that is obviously really you know, key. Um, it's not just voters are motivated to vote for these parties, but also uh, militants are motivated to devote their lives to you know, spreading a virulently um, nationalistic message because of um, these changes in political culture. And that's why yeah, I, I think we should pay more attention to uh, these developments and stop focusing so much on uh, voter research. And so a, a, a brief reply which is connected to the first question. <coughs> Is, so, again, in your essay, you work with the term paranoid nationalism. And today you used the waning of the anti-fascist consensus more. But I actually think that perhaps paranoid nationalism captures the PVV better than the result of the waning of the anti-fascist consensus, which could be a part of the... Uh, explanation why the paranoid nationalism is more successful. But I think that f uh, fascism also, it f flirts with violence often. So you get into a very specific debate whether it's fascist, uh, the movement is uh, uh, fascist. Well, I think in the essay in the Groene, which you should all read because it's a, a brilliant essay, you actually have what you just also said, this coherent ideology of the nation is under threat, there are internal and external enemies, the internal enemies have these connections with this outside uh, strong uh, power, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that um, that cap captures uh, more precisely, I think, what the movements are today. Uh, so that was basically the point that was triggered by the first question whether we should focus, is it the same as fascism? Well, perhaps not exactly the same, but it's a form of paranoid nationalism, which is already very problematic, of course. Yeah. Maybe to... Social to media, maybe you yeah, can uh, do that one. Also about, about the first question, I will say uh, something about social media. I think what is really important, if we look at the voters of, of the far-right parties, and in particular the PVV, it's very important to distinguish the current electorate of the PVV from the previous electorates of the PVV because it has changed, of course. It's, it has a broader electorate now, so many more people, uh, also more uh, people from the center now vote for the, for the PVV. And, and that's also, I think, and I agree, I think, that we should uh, not only vote, focus on voters but also on other things, like also the political parties, because the reason that the electorate of the PVV is so very different now is that uh, voters who before voted for mainstream parties but wa want to make policy a bit more restrictive on immigration have decided to vote for the PVV because of the strategies of the VVD. 
the uh, conservative mainstream party because they have opened the door to the PVV. They have, uh, as I said, right, Rutte before said that he didn't want to collaborate with the PVV, but the new VVD leader said that she uh, that the door was open, that uh, uh, working together with the PVV was an option, and therefore people who want more restrictive immigration policies have a reason to vote for the PVV because voting for that party might, well, give you what you, what you want. You don't want to vote for, well, you don't want policies that are, as a, that are as radical as those of the PVV. But if you vote for that party and that will end up in a coalition with mainstream parties, you might get more restrictive immigration policies without being too restrictive. That is what we, as political scientists, call policy overshooting. So you vote for a party that is a bit more radical than your own ideas are. So that is also one of the reasons, I think, why the electorate has changed a lot. Um, when it comes to media, I think on the one hand we should not overestimate the effect of social media because um, we see that the rise of the far right, it started before uh, we all used social, started to use social media. Um, and what is really important, I think, is that what happens on social media is when it has an effect on the overall voter, it is because it is picked up by mainstream media very often. Um, and we see that, for instance, when in media there is more focus on issues that are important for the radical right, or when there is more focus on the parties themselves, these parties become more successful as well. Um, on the other hand, I also think we should also not underestimate social media because one example from the previous Dutch elections, there were um, also uh, uh, elections among uh, people in schools who, are not, uh, who cannot vote yet. And they all support the PVV and Forum for Democracy in, 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 in large numbers. And um, I think one of the reasons, I don't know this, but my hunch would be that one of the reasons is that Forum for Democracy is very active on TikTok. And this is something that many, uh, many of us miss because I don't really know what's going on on TikTok. But uh, apparently there is this whole new uh, age group that is really, uh, that is really like um, um, exposed to all these Forum for Democracy messages. And therefore, that might be one of the reasons why they support this party. So I think on the one hand, we shouldn't overestimate the effect of social media. But also we, we should keep in mind that there is something going on there. Okay, well, uh, I'm afraid it's already 9.30, so uh, we've come, uh, we've come uh, to the end of our, our, uh, our session, but uh, clearly we, I think we could go on for hours, and uh, we have, uh, for, consequently, have a, a, a drink, so uh, if you like, you can always pose a question to our uh, panel uh, here, and I said this is not, there's no conclusion here, but I, would, I think it has been very useful to, to, uh, to be able to think about democracy, and I would like to have one big applause for the three panelists and for Nick for organizing it all. And there's some drinks at the back. Okay, thanks for coming.